Okay, guys, here's the Warriors of Elgato series that Bruce Kennedy put together back in 2001. I went over and visited with Bruce. It had to be about 2003 or four, something like that. I was working in Tucson, got to visit with him, and I bought all these uh, DVDs. I shared them before, and then W Hunting Supply put them out as a podcast, but I decided I'd upload them and put them on this channel for everybody to watch and enjoy. Let's don't forget my sponsors, Old South Dog Boxes. They're helping me out on a dog box. They're building for my Can-Am. Also, Onyx Maps. They're sponsoring me. They're helping out and, and, and uh, giving everybody, I think it's 100 years, a 20% discount when you buy the Onyx Maps, the app for your phone or for your computer. Uh, and then I get a little kickback from that too. So that helps the channel out. So if you buy Onyx Maps, help the channel out. Oh yeah, don't forget to join our email list. There'll be a graphic right here on the screen and then also down in the description will be a link. If anything ever happens to these social media platforms or anything, and we still have email, we'll still be able to stay in touch with each other and see what's going on and, and if we got anything coming out or, or, or if you guys need anything. So yeah, join that email list. I think it's really important. Anyway, Here's that series of, uh, of videos. Uh, I think there's like going to be like six of them. So, and Bruce Kennedy does all the intros for them. So, take it away, Bruce. Okay, today is November the 7th, 2003, and it's a pleasure to be with Mr. C.J. Prock of Young, Arizona. And uh, one of the nice things about this is that uh, Mr. Prock just turned 90 years old September 1st, correct? Right. Well, that's right. We wish you many more. C.J., uh, you want to tell us a little bit about where you was born, where you was raised, and how you got to be in Arizona and that sort of stuff. Just give us a little background. Yeah, I was born and raised in Hopkins County, and the county seat there was Sulphur Springs, Texas. And I was raised up as a farmer. My father was a farmer, and so he raised us kids up till we was grown there. And finally one of my older brothers come to got ready to run around a little. He's about grown. So he made a trip out here in Arizona and he liked it real well. And come back home and telling us all about it one thing or other. So my father decided to just sell out down there and move to Arizona. So he sold out. The, he had uh, six horse, horses and we was farming a three-team outfit then. He sold all that equipment and bought him a six-wheel drive truck. And we loaded our furniture and everything on there and, and moved to Arizona. It took us a week to come out here. <laughs> We'd travel at daytime and camp at night most of the time. And, but we had a lot of fun on the road, too. So we enjoyed the trip. So I've been in Arizona ever since, but I've done a lot of traveling since then, hunting, finally got in the hunting business, and, and so it puts you a lot of places to wherever the hunting's the best, that's where you try to go to. And so I hunted Idaho and for about 20 years, about six months out of the year, 
Then I hunted down in Belize for about 20 years. That's the uh, best hunting that I got into. The jaguar down there had never been hunted very much. And, of course, I'd hunted jaguar in old Mexico before I went down there, and I thought I was a pretty good jaguar hunter, but I learned I didn't know a whole lot about it till I got down there. First year I hunted in Belize, I lost 27 dogs to them jaguars. And so I finally woke up and learned I didn't know quite as much as I thought I did. And so I got to figuring out what is wrong and stuff like that. Of course, the main thing that was wrong, I had nobody had ever hunted them jaguar down there much. And they used to just coming into the them little ranch houses where they had them little native dogs and they'd kill them dogs and eat them, kill their hogs and stuff like that. So they'd glad to see me come down there and, and get after them jaguar. But it took me about three or four years to kill off a bunch of those old timers. And then, of course, I got a little more experience from hunting jaguar in that type of country. It was mostly jungles there. And I learned to try to stay out of the mountains because they get mountains while they get in them cave holes and dogs get to fight them while they, that's where they kill your dogs. As long as you can keep them out in the open and while them dogs learn to stay out of their way pretty good. I had a lot of fun down there. Killed a lot of jaguar. You said you lost 27 dogs? Yeah, 27. What, was it, did, did you have to have a different type of dog, or it was just the way you guys were hunting them? As a way that it was hunting them. And, yeah. uh, and the dogs wasn't experienced jaguar dogs. Mm -hmm. And they'd try to fight them jaguar, and at they better learn to respect them jaguar and stay out of the way. <laughs> is, is the way they have to do it. Yeah. And, uh, of course, they dogs get them where they can. Well, they'll bite them once in a while, try to make them climb a tree. But uh, they got to be pretty smart to bite them and not get caught because they're pretty fast. <laughs> Whatever uh, inspired you or who was who inspired you the most when you first started out hunting? Someone had to teach you a little bit. Yeah, uh, I learned a lot of it myself. Uh -huh. it took a long time for me to learn. I I used to try to catch him line and stuff with them $25 dogs and $50 dogs and, and and I finally woke up to the fact after about six, seven years of hunting that I didn't have the right kind of dog. So I went off up in Utah and places and trying to find out who had the best line dog in the country. So I ride on to Wiley Carroll up there and, and he was hunting for the government at that time. So I asked him, I says, would you sell me a good dog? And he said, yeah, I'll tell you, I got plenty of dogs. I got back home for her. I was asking him about buying them. I called him up and asked him about buying a good line dog, and he says, yeah, I got plenty of dogs, I'll sell you one. Well, the uh, price for a good dog then was around $150. It would buy a good, good line dog ordinarily. And so I, I'd heard which dog he had was the best dog. So he, I said, well, I want to buy old Ranger. 
he kind of laughed at me. He said, ah, oh, you couldn't buy a ranger. I said, well, you would sell him if you thought you was getting too much money, wouldn't you? <laughs> he said, oh, yeah, I'd do that. I said, well, what would it take to buy a ranger? He said, oh, it would take $500 to buy a ranger. I said, well, I'll be after him in a few days. I'll take him. And he just hung up the receiver on me right there. <laughs> so I drove up there and pulled out that $500 and laid it up there. I said, I want a ranger. Well, he says, I'm going to let you have him. He says, I sure do hate to, but he says, I'll let you have him. And then I went to catching game when I bought Ranger home. And that's where I got my foundation and learned that good dogs, no matter what the price, they paid off. You had to have good dogs if you was going to catch that game. Do you remember if he was a, what, what, what kind of dog was he, blue tick? Or blue red? tick. Yeah, blue tick. Yeah, big blue tick. Huh. And he was a very intelligent dog. Uh, had some, he was a smart dog, too. He, he no doubt uh, protect you from the game if you had something crippled in one thing or other. Uh -huh. I I had a had a guy to, that lived out here not far from right here on the Q Ranch out there. His name was Rogers. And I was living in Phoenix at that time. So he come down there and he says I need some help out there. It says uh, the bears just eating my cattle up, and of course it's in the summertime, so the season was closed. I said, he said, I want you to come out there and kill some of those bear for me. I says, well, you get a permission from the game department, and I'll sure come out there and give you some help. And so he did. He went and got permission from me to come out there and, and hunt them bear for him. So I went out there and hunted 30 days, and I killed, in that 30 days time, I killed 28 bear and three mountain lions in them 30 days. So that kind of eased this problem on losing cattle. Just a little bit, huh? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, uh, what's your favorite kind of dog? Favorite kind of hound? I like blue ticks real good. Yeah. Of course, you get fine good with them in all breeds if you, if you take your pains and, and Walkers are good dogs. They're fast dogs. But blue ticks are tough. And I've had some good red bone dogs. It was good dogs, too. Matter of fact, I got a good red bone right now that's a real good dog. He rig off the rig and does a good job tracking the whatever bear or lion, either one. About how many dogs you got now? Oh, I got about 20-some-odd right now. Yeah. I sell some every once in a while. Sell quite a lot of puppies. Do you, um, do you give your own shots and stuff like that? Yeah. Do you do all that? Do all that kind of stuff. What age do you like to start a pup? I like to start them at about, oh, I like to start them when they're just puppies big enough to run around. Yeah. Just gradually work them into it, not put them, but I like for them to be about nine, ten months old before I put them in on a bear or a lion, either one. Yeah. I just let them go along with them. Horses and 
and stuff like that. And ordinarily, I let them run whatever they want to run till I get ready to break them. And one thing or other, and then I'll break them out from running that trash. They, they run with the other dogs, and they make snogs out of them pretty quick. Now you hunted you hunted some of the Lee brothers, didn't you? Yeah, I hunted with Dale. Never did a hunt with Clay. Clay got married to a widow woman up in uh, North Park, Northwest part of the Over in the East, Blues, wasn't it? Yeah, over in the Blues. There. Yeah. And I didn't ever hunt with him, but I met him several times. But I hunted with Dale pretty good. He was a good hunter. Yeah. Caught lots of game. Did you ever get any dogs from them? Uh, I used to buy some young dogs from them. Yeah. Yeah, every once in a while, back when I first started hunting. What's the biggest lion you ever caught in weight? About a fraction over 200 pounds. Yeah. I... Biggest lion I ever saw caught weighed 216 pounds. Yeah. And that is up in Utah. And I used to hunt with a guy up there, and he was a good lion hunter. And I bought a few dogs off of him once in a while. So I went by there one day, and he just caught that lion and had it on the scales there then. I looked at him pretty close, and, and he said, what do you think that lion will weigh? I said, oh, I think he'll weigh about 215 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so he weighed 216, so I was guessing pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> you should have bet him a dog or two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about the lion scrapes? They front or back feet? Uh, they use them back feet. They'll stand up on their front feet and just start quivering with the back feet and then kick up a big pile right there. And, and, and they definitely use back feet because I've seen them do it. Yeah. Yeah, I thought you had. Yeah, yeah. Would you rather ride a horse or a mule out there chasing those dogs? I'd rather ride a horse myself. Uh, all the lion hunters that are a good part of them that I used to hunt with it asked me, says, why don't you, why don't you ride a mule? And he says, get you a good mule or you. You do better than you would on a horse. I said, well, if I ever find a good mule, well, I'll sure buy it. <laughs> and so I, I did buy a few mules later on, and they worked out all right. But it takes, a, they, they don't learn as quick as a horse, and they'll, you never can depend on a mule way I find it. They'll try to rub you off on a tree in a tight place, this, that, and the other, where a horse will learn to protect you if he can. And that's the reason I always rode horses instead of mules. Did you ever get bucked off out there? Oh, yeah. I've been bucked off a few times. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they all have. Yeah. There's a lot of boogers out there. A lot of boogers out there. <laughs> First thing you know, you hit the ground when you least expect it. <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather run a lion or rather run a bear? Oh, I a lot better run a lion. How come? Well, a lion, you can ride right along and, and watch your dogs trail the line up. Sometimes they go a long ways. And a bear, that's mostly fast running and a hard race run, and it keeps you riding hard, and then even at that way, you lose your dog sometimes. Yeah. But you can 
on an old line track where you can ride along there and just watch your dog trail and see how they work it and how they carry it along. And it's a pleasure. I really enjoy it. Well, you get to help them too, don't you? Yeah, you bet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, they learn to depend on you to help them. It, uh, they lose a track and can't get it going, and, and you ride around out in front, circle out there to you find a track. All you have to do is holler, here it is, and boy, they'll just come a running over there, and wherever you point your finger, boy, they'll run over there and start rooting, and they'll pick that track up and go on. Yeah. Get smart quick. On scent, what's about the oldest track you ever started and caught? Well, of course, your trailing conditions has most the effect on that. But I've, I've hit some three-day-old tracks and caught them. Using those cold-nosed blue ticks? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have. Blue ticks has got a good cold nose, and they're tough dogs. They're a little tougher breed than most breeds. Of course, plot dogs are tough dogs, but they don't settle down like a blue tick. Listen to you, they're a little wild natured. Most of them, of course, you'll find some good ones. But I like blue ticks better. What are some of the tricks that you've seen those lines pull? I mean, like backtracking and, and uh, trying to get, I mean, and trying to uh, do something with their trail to throw you off. You ever seen any of that? You bet. Lots of it. Like what? Well, first place, the way a line haunts ordinarily, of course, it depends on what type of country, but they generally hunt lines in the mountains and they act have them long points that come out and you view over the canyons. Now I've seen them old line walk, oh, maybe two or three hundred yards down a long point that way and smelling around and looking off on both sides of the hills. And then they'd turn right around and walk. I'd back up the same track they come down there until they get back up to the rim again. Then they'll cut off and go round the rim. They like follow them rims. And they can smell that game off under there and then they'll figure out a way to get down there and catch it. I guess that wind is blowing up yeah. out of that canyon there. Yeah, yeah, it helps a lot. Huh. Do you ever... Uh, uh, tree many of those lines in caves or in the bluffs or anything? Yeah, there we got a few old lines around here now that are really tough about getting in them bluffs. And they can get around in them bluffs better than their dogs can. Yeah. Because they can jump quite a little ways across the, and then the dog, he'll have to go down and find him a way to get around there. So a lot of them will get away from some pretty good pack of dogs in the, in them mountains where they're rough. And when you're out lion hunting and you're on a horseback, you're just out trying to cut a track, how many dogs do you like to have with you lion hunting? Three to four is plenty. I used to think seven was a good pack of dogs. But you don't need that many. They, unless they're really educated on hunting together, where well, they get in one another's way when you get too many dogs. And that's where you have trouble sometimes training young dogs. You, they'll want to get in your dog's way in one thing or other. I used to. I was hunting all the time for a living back then. And on the weekend, well, a bunch of the young hunters would want to come up and hunt with you. And I was always invited them 
come on up. And I I had a bunch of dogs well trained there. I've seen the old dogs go. And they know the country better than I did. It, they're getting in pretty good line country. And them pups always in the way. And they just jump a deer out there and just start right out on it. Get all them pups there to the deer and then they turn around, come back and go on hunting. <laughs> <laughs> to learn how to get them out of the way. <laughs> yeah, I, I know what you mean on that. Yeah. Why did you yell that? Now, when, when you like to hunt, say if you got three or four dogs out there, are they all free casting, or if you just got one strike dog and the rest of them coupled up? Well, it's uh, when you, if you get four dogs that you can trust in one thing or other, I just use them free casting. But if there's uh, some of them that's not a hundred percent true then i'll couple them together and make them follow horses until the true dog get one going then i'll jump off the horse and turn them loose and let them go with them that's the way i get do them dogs it's not a hundred percent broke so actually what you're saying is the key to that if you don't have Good dogs, uh, dogs being almost virtually trash broke, then you have to have total control over everything else. You bet. You got to have that. Got to have it. Or it won't work. This won't work. <laughs> what about uh, care and maintenance of your dogs and your horses? Uh, would you agree that you've got to keep them in tip top shape and you got to take care of them and feed them good and grain those horses and have them shod and all that good stuff? Absolutely. That's the key to hunting is having good equipment. Yeah. I know uh, so many guys now, I don't know why they think that, but when they start out, they they starve those dogs. They take them too far. I mean, they, they look like baloney milk cows. Yeah. I know what you mean. And they'll have one horse or one mule, and they'll try to ride him for 10 days straight. Yeah. And that, that doesn't work either. No, that don't work. You got to keep your livestock in good shape. You got to keep your dogs in good shape. Yeah. You rotate your dogs? You bet. Yeah. How many days do you rest them? Oh, just according to how beat they are, of course. But I try to give them a couple of days rest every once in a while, and then I'll throw them back in if they're ready to go. You can always look and tell if they're up to getting a hard race and put them right back in there. They get toughened up to it. What type of feed do you like to feed them? I feed Old Roy. Old Roy? Yeah. At, uh, it's a good balanced diet and keeps your dogs in good shape. When you catch those bear lion, you you feed some of that meat to those dogs. Yeah, yeah, I always let them eat a little of that. That, <laughs> that keeps them going. Yeah, makes them anxious to trim them on the counter. They know they're going to get a piece of liver or something or other. It's a bonus. Yeah. Now, when you started, they didn't have all of these fancy shocking collars and, and uh, tracking collars and all that good stuff. That's true. It's so what did you think when you started using shocking collars to break them? How did you like that compared to the old way? Well, it all improvements, and it's better. Yeah. Yeah. Do you use the uh, tracking collars very much? Yeah, all the time. All the time. I hardly ever turn a dog loose without a tracking collar on it. What type of tracking system do you use, do you know? Yeah. I buy most of my stuff through the Boatman catalog. And, yeah. And they, they, they have 
good stuff. Mm-hmm. They stand behind their stuff. And that's where I get most of my tracking equipment. And they have shocking equipment, too, that you, if your dog is a trashy, well, you can put that shocking equipment around his neck and he starts something he ain't supposed to. Well, you can give him a little shock and that generally breaks him pretty quick. He don't like that shocking. Got to be careful with that, too, don't you? Oh, definitely. You can run a dog real quick. Yeah. Just give too much. You got to know when to stop and not shock him too much. Yeah. What advice would you give somebody just starting out today that just say he's in his early 20s and just full of beans and wants to go become a lion hunter? What advice would you give that young fella? Well, the first thing I'd advise him to go with a lion hunter and find him somebody that would put up with him and, <laughs> and go along with him and watch what he does. You learn faster that way. Yeah. And the next thing is get good dogs. No matter what they cost, they're worth the money. What what do you what would you say is a good price on a say a started strike dog today? Well I sold two dogs yesterday that was good dogs and they was getting a little age on them. And I got twenty eight hundred dollars a piece for them for what I got for my dog. Yeah. Some people probably get more, some less. This depends on the, the hunting guys. They a lot of times they'll get in hard shape, not to have a little money, and they'll sell a good dog pretty cheap sometimes. And, well, um, you you know you look at the the price the line hunters charge a lot of. Them, Ballpark figures about three thousand dollars for a seven day hunt. Yeah, that's right. So you got a twenty eight dollar dog and, and he trees a lion in one week, you've already paid for that dog. That's right. So from there on it's all gravy. So I mean what yeah, that's you're, right. You're better off in the long run just to go ahead and put out the money, just go ahead and get that good dog and get on with it. Yeah, it's sure right. Most of the guys, whenever they start out, Everybody gives them their their giveaway dogs. Yeah. And, but that guy who's giving that dog, well, boy, that's a good dog. Yeah. Well, if that was such a good dog, he wouldn't be giving it away. That is right. But everybody, these guys just starting out, they think, man, that, that's a good deal. And uh, like you were saying, uh, y- you'll fight that monster for a long, long time because nothing's going to happen until you get some dogs. That's exactly right. Yep. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. If you're gonna do it, you you got to go get you some dogs somewhere. You sure right. Hmm. Do you ever take any famous people? Yeah, I've carried a lot of famous hunters, uh, guys, uh, friends from Iran, and uh, the king of Spain's brother. Mm. A lot of those big time people I've hunted most of them. How about John Wayne? Yeah, I've hunted John Wayne. Really? Yeah, he, he's a good hunter. He's quite a guy. I, uh, I've heard that he's just a really a nice guy. Yeah, he Or nice. was, you know, I mean, yeah, of course, he's been a dead now. Nice fella. Anybody else? Yeah, you know, most of them, there's not too many people that could really catch Jaguar successfully. So when people learn that I could catch them successfully, which I had, uh, that's when I moved down to Belize there because 
lots of jaguar down there, and I learned how to catch them. Well, then the news got around, and so I stayed booked up most of the time. At one time, I was booked up seven years in advance. Just uh, left a few openings along for emergency calls in there, stuff like that. Just word of mouth. Yeah. I bet you a time or two you run across some of those dudes that you wish you'd never seen, right? <laughs> yeah, that happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sure does. The guys that, that I've interviewed, a lot of them, they don't like the publicity. They just like to go by word of mouth because the clients that they get are, are really good, good people. Yeah. And, uh, they, I've had a couple of them say that if you go ahead and advertise what shows up at your front door, you may not want. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I just, that brings the point for the deal I was talking out down there in release. Uh -huh. I had one guy, he was a, a kind of a foreigner, a little mixed breed out in New York. Uh oh. And he come down there and hunt. And I was equipped to hunt four different clients at the same time down there. So I put him with a Grow my boys. It was real good boys, and, and he went out that morning, and they caught him a nice jaguar, real nice jaguar. Well, I always checked on all of my hunting boys and one thing or other. And so I come around where they're skinning that jaguar out. I said, "Well, heck of a nice jaguar." Oh, he's in a little old scrawny thing, but I guess he'll do. And he never tipped none of the boys or nothing. And so he went on back home, and then I got up in, in Idaho. Well, he called me up. He says, I want to book a hunt up there, will you? I said, well, I'm all filled up now. I said, I don't have room for nobody. And he rocked on a few days, and he just kept calling me for about four different times he called me there. And I'd tell him the same thing every time I was all booked up. He says, well, I'll tell you. He said, I know I was a horse that's funny down there and, and bleeds when I hunted you with your boy. But says, if you'll hunt me up there, I'll guarantee you I'll be a different fella. I said, well, in a case like that, you come on up, we'll take you hunting. And he did come up, and he was a different fella. He, he learned. He learned, yeah. <laughs> I think I read about that in some book. I wouldn't doubt it a bit. I'm <laughs> sure I can't, I, I, I don't recall, but I think I read about that, about you and that guy. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, he was something else. Yeah. Well, what do you think the future of lion hunting in this country? Well, uh, it's getting rougher and rougher all the time. It, uh, it can last a while, but uh, not too awful long, I don't think. Five, eight, ten years? That's something like that. Yeah. Uh, it seems like the game department wants to, in most places, they're tightening down a little all, all the time. May take a little longer than that, but not not much, I don't think. They what? keep changing the laws and one thing or other where it'd be hard to make a living at it. Yeah. Well, anymore, these guiding outfitters, they've got to hunt in four different states. Yeah. Because right. they've got to, they have to hunt everything they can possibly hunt. Absolutely. And to make a living. I mean, yeah. those four wheel drive trucks and these dogs and horses and everything else cost a lot of money. You bet. And it, 
and you have to be equipped good if you yep. expect to care out hunters. Have to be have well, you have to have dependable equipment too. You bet you. Yeah. I mean, these guys paying out three thousand dollars for a hunt, they expect to to go on a hunt. Yeah, that's right. Not be fixing broken down trucks and all that good yeah. stuff. And one time that well, you take the Lee boys. For instance, I'm not trying to talk about other hunters, but they're gone now. But they come down in Belize there and wanted to get a permit to hunt down there in Belize. And so I went to the meeting where they had to meet with the government. I recommended to the Lee boys to the government but they wouldn't give him a permit. And I was pretty well acquainted with the government guy. After after they left, one thing or other, I asked him, I said, that guy, I said, that boy's a good hunter. I said, uh, how come your boy didn't give him a permit? There's plenty of room down south of town there. I don't ever go down there. He says, well, that ain't the kind of guys that we want down here. We want somebody that can help our people down here. And the Lee boys, they drive old equipment and break down every time it goes somewhere or another and stuff like that. So that is just not the kind of people we want down here. We want somebody that'll do something for our people. So that's the reason they didn't get a permit down there. Okay. They always blame me for it, but they thought I didn't do them no good, but I was doing my best to help them. Hmm. You remember what year you started hunting uh, with hounds? Uh, Of course, I was hunted with dogs even back in Texas, but this squirrel dogs and possum dogs and stuff like that. But uh, it was about uh, the first year I went to Belize was in 62. 62. Yeah. And of course, I'd been hunting probably. 20 years in by that time. So I probably hunted, started hunting big time long in the early 40s. Can you tell me what it is that you like about taking hounds and go chasing a lion? Well, it's main thing, it's good exercise. And you get to where you enjoy it, well, yeah, it, there's something or other that's uh, there that you can't keep from enjoying. Uh, when you go to set, you put a straddle that old horse and turn them hounds loose, you feel revived and ready to go right there. Get a big kick out of it. Enjoy. I don't think there's a a sound like a pack of dogs on a cold, frosty morning, say in October, going in a deep canyon somewhere, and they're just ringing off the walls. To me, that's that's beautiful. Yeah, that sure is. It's enjoyable. Yeah. And the more you hunt, the more you learn about hunting. And I had a fella in here this morning was uh, telling me, all about it. he'd run on to a bunch of lion out there that killed he had the had the horns off a deer that they just freshly killed and one thing or other and he was a, his dogs couldn't tree them lion and I don't know why this didn't elaborate on telling him 
<laughs> how to do it because I didn't think he would listen to me no way. So I just let him go. <laughs> but I could have told him how to catch those lines if he had proper dogs. First place, I don't think he had the proper dogs or he'd have caught them anyway. Yeah. And so I just let him pass by, which I ordinarily try to help a feller when he tries, but I didn't think he'd appreciate it. I knew him pretty good, so I just let him go ahead. Did you ever get seriously hurt out lion, or lion hunting, bear hunting? Uh, it can happen, and a lot of people, big-time hunters, have accidents and get people killed and hurt, even even the Lee boys, they, they got three or four people killed while they was hunting. And I've been real lucky, I guess, in my time. I've never got nobody hurt, never got anybody injured in any way. I've just been lucky. One time in... Uh, I was hunting up in uh, Springville there, and it had come a little snow and ice, and I had a colonel in this in the army, and he was uh, had a big father and had four or five people with him then, and and so he wanted to tree a bobcat, so I got out there and we. Oh, Treating Bobcat early that morning. And it was kind of on a little downgrade place there. And so he's trying to shoot that cat up there, and the cat had moved around behind the tree, and, and he would go walking around there with his hammer cocked back on his rifle and one thing or other. That ice and stuff. I says, Colonel, I says, uh, let let your hammer down on your gun before you start walking around. And he didn't pay no attention to me. He just kept on directly. I says, God damn it, Colonel, let your hammer down on your gun, mm -hmm. or I'm gonna take it away from him. And so he he let it down, but he got mad at me. And he, he never would hunt with me no more. He never <laughs> would send me nobody. <laughs> but I didn't get nobody hurt anyway, and that was a dangerous place. Walking around there on that ice, one thing or other. Well, he could just slip and touch the trigger and he could have hurt somebody so, bad. Well, you know, you know as well as I do, when you chase those dogs and everything else, especially on horses, you go in the country you wouldn't normally go into, and you just come around the corner, and all of a sudden you're in trouble. Yeah, that's right. You got a problem. You got a problem. You got to be careful. Yeah, you're sure right. Well, is there anything else you want to talk about, or I guess we've been far enough, or whatever. I uh, I really want to thank you for being on this. Uh, glad to be there. And I really, I really, it's a pleasure to meet you. I've, I've read a lot about you, read stories and everything else, and heard guys talk about you, and, and it's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Proc. Uh, that, I appreciate that. I thank you. And I, I enjoy hunting yet. Uh, as I uh, was saying there a while ago, I passed 90, but I still enjoy it. Well, there's nothing's going to take that away from you. That's right. Nothing. <laughs> no matter what, you'll always enjoy that. Yeah, you bet you. Well, let's, let's go outside here. We'll film some of these dogs of yours. Want to do that? Uh, I've, uh, I've got a red bone dog out there that's a real good top dog. He's... Uh, 
He's gritty, but he works off of the rig good. He'll start a track, that, and you can just let him down, and he puts his whole heart in it and, and, and does a good job. Good yeah. job up, Doug. Yeah. He's catching a lot of game. Well, we'll go out here and turn the camera on him. Okay. We'll just do that. This is a Jaguar that uh, Mr. Prom killed in his trophy room. And here is another one. Beautiful mounts. It's a beautiful buck up there, too. Hadn't come out of the Kai Bell bear, that's mm -hmm. untypical. That is a, a big bear. It's called a big bear. Here's another lion rug on the floor. Of course, we've already filmed that lion. And right back around here behind me. For goodness like, but there is a big black bear. That little deer to your right there is a police. Out there lying the upper deer head up there come out of the drip cut. Huh. These are some of dogs, CJ. Real good dog there. Whoa. Just be up there. Whoa, whoa. Whoa! Whoa! Here's a little blue tech pup. Whoa! 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 What's that dog's name? Blue. Yeah. Blue. Take it easy. Take it easy. Take it easy. 